welcome to Quantum Drive. I'm your host, Rob. And on this episode, as I had mentioned before, during some of our off weeks, we would have interviews with cast, crew, and people that are working on Orville-related things. So for this episode, I'll be joined by Dan Govier, who's the project lead at Messy Desk Interactive. Messy Desk is making the Orville Interactive Fan Experience, which is a completely fan-made game that is a recreation of the Orville, the ship itself, with tons of interactive elements within it. Uh, It's a game that you can experience in multiplayer, in VR or non-VR, so you can play with your friends, you can explore on your own, there'll be things to do inside the game, and I sat down with Dan to get a lot more information on the Orville Interactive Fan Experience, including where it got started, some of the things that you'll be able to do in the game, some of the Easter eggs that are in the game, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Before we get into the interview, I do just want to give you a quick heads up that while we've been staying pretty spoiler-free as far as Orville things go in our episode discussions, we want people who haven't watched the show yet to be able to listen to those for the first time as we go and not get spoiled for things that might happen later. That is not the case with our interview episodes, so there are things that we reference within this interview that have happened on the show. I don't think there's any major spoilers that you have to be aware of, but there are little things here and there that we point to, even though we don't necessarily go into huge plot points. Lastly, we did have some audio issues while recording this episode, so the audio quality does go in and out here and there, but I ask that you hang with it because I think the content is great and you'll get a lot out of hearing the interview, especially if you are interested in the upcoming interactive fan experience. So that's it for me. Please enjoy the interview with Dan Govier, project lead at Messy Desk Interactive. I'm very excited to talk about this because I saw the video, the first one that you released that really showed off tons of parts of the ship. And I'm super excited for this project, not only as a gamer, but as a huge fan of the Orville. So I know this isn't the first project that you worked on, but uh, what inspired you to work on the Orville fan experience? Um, Because it it encapsulates everything we love about um, Star Trek Deep uh, Deep Space Nine and Next Generation. Um, Mm. It's got that that view of the future, that sort of idealistic vibe that we love. Um, and, and the aesthetic of the show um, and what Seth's created there, which was just brilliant. And it, it, was, it was a no-brainer for us. It was like, what should we do? Let's do the Orville. And like unanimously, everyone in the room was like, yes, let's do this. So <laughs> it, it was, yeah, it was absolutely from day one. That's what we were doing. How, uh, how long was the transition between uh, when Stage 9 wrapped up and you were said, okay, let's shift gears and go into the Orville now? Pretty quickly. I mean, we were we were on our, our Discord channel, which is chatting away. I, I would say within a week to two weeks of of our, of our season statistics letter that came through, um, and literally, I'd already got a corridor built and put together just as a mock up for So, can we do this? What does it look like? <laughs> That's crazy. So that makes me ask then, because I mean, if you did that that quickly, what is your background? What is your experience in making this kind of tech? So we've been. Uh, sort of team-wide working on this kind of thing for, I guess, some of us since the 90s. I mean, I cut my teeth making levels for, for Quake on the Quake engine. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. And we've got guys that were making levels for Half-Life 2. And, um, you know, so we, we've got guys who've been working on SP tools for, for a long, long time. We've tried to build probably a good dozen times. And the technology just hasn't been there for it. So yeah. you know, when Unreal Engine came along and we embraced what Unreal Engine had to offer and it's just gone from strength to strength from there. Wow. That's it. So how many people are uh, working on this team? Probably about half a dozen to a dozen off and on. There's only about four or five of us who work pretty much permanently on the project. And the other guys will just chuck us an asset every now and then because you know, we're all fans. We're all doing it in our spare time. So it's, you know, as and when someone's available. How much time would you say on a like on an average day you would spend working on this? Personally, wow, <laughs> probably I'd say eight to eleven hours a day, just you know wow. tinkering in the engine. I mean, I was pulling eighteen-hour days in in the week leading up to the video. 
That's incredible. So <laughs> that is that is a lot of time that shows your your passion for the show and the fandom and everything. That's amazing. And I know a lot of people are very thankful for this, so I can only say thank you from me, but I'm sure there are many, many other people that would say thank you as well if they could. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested about is when you were working on Stage 9, you had kind of this huge catalog of stuff to pull from as kind of like reference material. I mean, you had technical manuals, other fan creations, stuff like that. Now we're talking about something where you really have like 26 episodes of source material what kind of challenges have you run into when trying to construct the ship? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think our biggest challenge was nailing the the lighting and the materials because the lighting change changes on the show all the time. So mm. even between scenes, the the vibe and the feel of the lighting can be completely different. Um, and you know, they have a like say the sick bay for example. On one episode, it'll be really dark and moody. On another episode, it'll be really bright and well lit. So it's a case of, you know, which one do we go for? Do we go for the brightly lit version or the moody version? So we're kind of going for an average <laughs> on all the various versions of everything. Sure. Yeah, and you know, something like Star Trek, I mean, you've got, again, decades worth of fan work to call upon, people making set plans and schematics and things. Um, and nothing really exists like that for the Orville at all. So in terms of set plans, we've we've got reasonably good blueprints for the studio set, which we've kind of scoured the net for and get these obscure websites every now and then that post some things. So we'll grab it when we see it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but for the for the actual ship layout itself, we're pretty much making it up as we go along. Wow, that's crazy. So I mean, yeah, there's at this point there's probably so many parts of the ship that they haven't even touched on. Mm. So are you kind of doing some guesswork there or just kind of filling in holes as you'd like to? It's kind of like an educated guess. So okay. we've got a guy in our Discord, actually, who he actually um, made some spreadsheets that had the name and job of every member of uh, the Enterprise D, every crew member, every civilian. He had the whole lot kind of done in the spreadsheet. Wow. <laughs> crazy, crazy work. Um, and he's yeah. doing the same thing for the Orville. So we know kind of how many crew quarters we need and what what positions that the people on the ship buy. So we're pulling all that together and building the layout of the ship around who needs to be on it, what are their jobs, what technology needs to be there, you know, how big are the engines going to be on the inside and just you know little things like that. That's wild. And there's, as the video was going through and I was seeing all the kind of ornamentation and the decorations <laughs> in the different rooms, you paid very specific detail to even just like the knickknacks on shelves and little things like that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's unbelievable the time that has gone into this and the passion for it shows. And are you really like doing everything possible to represent like all the episodes we've seen? Sure. I mean, I have to give a huge shout out to Claire, um, one of the people on our team. I mean, she spent the past two days scouring every single episode frame by frame capturing ornaments and things on shelves and then she's got onto google and she's found all the various shops and things which sell those exact items and even the really crazy little glass like spider web of like glass things that are on desks or these these weird ornate um glass formations that they've got around the ship i mean she's managed to find all of them on like ebay or, or somewhere else so yeah it's like crazy detailed that's incredible. Uh, well, thank you, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> so, in that in that vein, if you're if you're if you're scouring every episode that closely, there must be an insane amount of Easter eggs on this ship. Oh, for sure, for sure, yeah. Are there any that we should be on the lookout for that you're particularly proud of? Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I guess we're going to put in as many references from the show as we can. Mm -hmm. like like the p corner in the shuttle bay <laughs> that's already there <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not sure at what point that's going to make an appearance but it's definitely going to be there okay um, you know we've got ideas for various missions and little little quests and things for players to do like you know track down all the cigarettes that borders is hidden around the ship you know just oh my god just little things like that that's hilarious so okay so you mentioned missions because in the video it says it's a heavy sandbox experience. Sure. So what kind of missions and interaction are you planning on having in it? So we've put a lot of thought into how we go about doing this. 
Um, and the way that makes the most sense to us is that obviously we want to populate the ship with NPC crew. So you have people all over the ship going about their business. And mm -hmm. we like the idea of all those people having various things to offer the player for things to do. Um, mm -hmm. The example we've used a few times now is, say, Yafit, for example. Um, there's a piece of Yafit somewhere on the ship. So you know, you'll see Yafit wandering around looking bothered. So you can go up to him, click on him, and he'll say, oh, there's a piece of me missing somewhere. Please go find it. So you can run around the ship with a little scanner, finding that little piece of Yafit to take back to him. So <laughs> I love that. So they're not they're not missions in like the the usual uh, single player narrative sense. They're just little one off experiences that you can get from an NPC, and and maybe they're all kind of unlocked after you've spoken to the NPC. So you don't okay. need to go back to that NPC. You could just like go into the eSIM and load it from there or something. Oh, okay, that's really cool. Yeah, because. I mean, it's super impressive if all you planned on doing was like, here's the ship, check it out, play around with stuff, walk around. But that's like another level of, hey, we really want you to enjoy your time here sure. and we're going to give you some stuff to do while you're here. That's great. I love that. Yeah, we, we really want it to be a, a role play tool. Um, this is something we plan for the Enterprise D um, and never got around to in the end. But um, we want people who who just want to exist on that ship in that world to be able to just walk mm -hmm. around you know, as a character of their choosing and you know just live their life on the ship and maybe get their friends together and you know have a, a whole role play scenario together that's cool. um, i think i think the ship lends itself really well to that kind of thing okay then if there's functionality in the ship does that mean i can pilot it too yep yep you can um at the moment if you walk up to the helm controls you can just hover your mouse over the controls press the buttons and and the ship reacts in real time it's like pressing the your and and um and that kind of thing um wow and if you sit in the in the seat immediately in front of the helm controls then the keyboard takes over and you can like wasd to move the ship around and stuff wow that's crazy so okay well all right so if we can pilot the ship now now that brings up a whole other set of questions <laughs> so you're dealing with something that's outer space that's like infinite so what is the scope then what are we talking like where can i go so we'd like to feature all of the planets that we see on the show. We already had the tech built for going from different planets. Um, so, you know, you'd engage the quantum drive and it would take you to your location. And mm -hmm. then the real question is, what do you do once you get there? Okay. So I'd say at the barest minimum, yes, you can fly to say, I don't know, the Mocklin homeworld or something. But once you get there, it's a case of, you know, can we build engaging experiences to take that only take place when you're there? Oh, Wow. So yeah, that's, you know, we're, we're talking probably quite a long way down the line, but. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, <laughs> but at, the, at the very least, you'll be able to fly there and at least orbit the planet looking at it, if nothing else. Yeah. And again, like that's, that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that's already super appreciated, but anything like hearing that you have plans above and beyond that is absolutely amazing. So uh, as being a fan of the Orville, then is there a thing that's really important to you to include even if it's like on a, a dream wish list that maybe it's not something you're going to get around to right away but it's like man if we could just get this thing in there that would be great oh i think for me personally something that i'm i'd really really love to include is to give the crew proper ai so they all have so they go about their daily business as though they were actually there. So they wake up in their quarters, they physically walk to wherever their shift takes them. Mm. And then they go you know, to the commissary and have lunch. <laughs> you know, So all of the NPC crew are just living and working on the ship. And as the player, you can just go and interact with them and kind of be involved with them going about their business. I think it's probably going to be maybe a pie in the sky idea, but I think we might be able to include some limited form of just automated pathing that puts puts the NPCs where they need to be at the right time. Sure, sure. But yeah, I, I think making it a living, breathing ship is probably the top of my priority list. I guess one of the other questions then is, based on the resources that you got and kind of planning out the the ship the way you are, I imagine you have a much better idea of like how things are laid out than we ever really see in the show. Has that given you like a different perspective when watching? Yeah, it has definitely. Because there's things like the cargo bay. Now you see 
uh, a really dark room. I think you see in Firestorm where um, uh, they're in there fighting that clown. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think that's supposed to be the cargo bay, but there's a shuttle parked up in the cargo bay. So that, yeah. that then asks the question, well, how do they get the shuttle into the cargo bay? And um, Adam, one of the guys that's on the team, um, he's devised a way of actually, on, on their sides of the shuttle bay, the walls are angled. So you can like mm-hmm. open them up and there's a track at the upper level which you can put cargo on and then it runs it backwards into the cargo bay oh wow shuttle bay um so th- there are all these kind of engineering challenges that we now have to think about so it's not just a case of put a room there and put a, a cargo like hold there it's like well how do you get stuff into it how does that actually work because we you don't want to just put stuff there for the sake of it we want it yeah. we want it to work so yeah and we, we've got two cargo holds kind of end to end immediately behind the shuttle bay and they fit exactly between the the struts of where the engine rings start to go out so that they fit in that space really snugly with just enough room for a corridor each side so building the the inside within the external dimensions of the ship is always a fun challenge you know when you go back and watch the show afterwards you kind of you start watching it in 3d thinking oh i I kind of i can picture where they are on the ship now on the inside which is kind of cool do you feel in a way like you're kind of writing background source material for this because <laughs> it feels like it's a me. <laughs> yeah i mean again we, we want to stay true to to the actual canon material as much as we possibly can um and you know one of the things we're keen to do is to have like a commentary mode where you can enable this mode where little speech bubbles appear over things so you go up and click on it and it gives you a bit of like wiki spiel oh that's just showing yeah you. i love that so you know what is it where did it come from what's it for and you know, it'd be great if we could get some, some you know, official commentary on that. But again, that's, that's a job way down in the future. But now we're just going to you know, copy paste from the wiki page and, and stick that in there. So, I mean, you're telling me all these amazing things and all the time you're devoting to it and all the people that are involved in it. If we can rewind for a little bit and kind of jump back to when not only the Orville project started, but even before that, mm. what was it that inspired you and said, you know what, I just I have to do this thing? Wow. So I, I think for me, this started, again, I'd say back in the 90s. So around about 96, 97, you know, Quake had just come out, the first proper 3D first-person shooter. And, mm. you know, I was building levels for it. And um, I actually had one of my levels featured on in a PC Mac in the UK, which was kind of cool. Yeah, that's super cool. And, um, and my partner at the time had um, all these blueprints for the Enterprise D. And like this penny dropped. And I was like, oh, I can build it. And I got maybe like half of the first deck done before the engine went, nope. <laughs> <laughs> try, try again in 20 years and maybe the technology will be ready for it. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's something that I've always wanted to do. So it's just a passion for the, the level making combined with your passion for the material? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we're all huge sci-fi fans and everyone on the team has a real passion for recreating these sci-fi environments. So, you know, to do something, a project of this scale and scope, it's just, yeah, it's, it's in our blood. We just feel this need to do it. That's amazing. If only everyone could find something that they're this passionate about, but I absolutely love that you've taken the initiative to go into it and put all these people together and make this happen to the level that it's at. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so back to the game a little bit. I have to ask about the environmental simulator, because if you're adding all this other functionality in there, do you have any plans for that? We do. So the idea is um, it'll have a few base programs you can run. Again, I mentioned Adam earlier. Um, Adam's also created the transition effect for loading a simulation. And it, okay. it, it's really, really good. It looks brilliant. So everything kind of twinkles and fades and turns into a grid and then another environment appears. And the idea is we want to hide the chips that power the simulations all around the ship. Oh, that's brilliant. So, um, so to name one, the Cove of Pleasure, <laughs> it's, it's something we'd love to do, but you'll have to find it. You'll have to find the, sh- the, the chip that powers that simulation on the ship somewhere. It's a little, little, little Easter egg that you can find. Uh, and, and maybe the ship will start malfunctioning once you run it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so good. <Yeah>. So good. <laughs> I, uh, this is a personal request and I'm sure you'll get around to it anyway, but, um, one of my favorite episodes is the cell phone oh, and, yeah. then, uh, and the, the woman created from all that and stuff. I don't know if you have any plans to include even just the cell phone 
because that's really like all I need to kind of get the whole reference. But yeah, for sure. Basically, everything you see in any of the episodes, we plan to include somewhere. So we, we want to just literally build everything, litter the ship with everything, and and just let fans explore and, and find things. And one of the things we plan to do to, to help operation is that the, the people on our Discord channel have been following it for years, where we can get them to be the crew members and give them the chance to customize their crew quarters to match their personality. So, so as you're exploring through the crew quarters, they're, they're not just going to be some randomly generated thing. They're going to reflect the, the personality of a real human being. Wow. Kind of in a set within the era of the show that's set in, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, we want to make exploration meaningful. Because it could be, you know, it'd be quite boring exploring yeah. you know, all these series of identical rooms one after another. Now, I've also heard you mention uh, multiplayer and other sources. Mm. What is the multiplayer aspect on this going to be like? So, again, going back to the role play aspect, we want people to be able to just hang out together on the ship, maybe um, do some role play, you know, do some scenarios. I think it'll be quite popular for that. Uh, and also, you know, just pick up a gun and have a death match. <laughs> <laughs> which we, which funnily enough for the past three or four days as a team we've been doing nothing but that so oh really so um we've got the steam multiplayer working at the moment it still needs a bit of work but it's working so someone will go on and then someone else will join them we'll think right okay so we'll just test this thing and then someone else on the team just runs up from nowhere and kills everyone and we're like oh. <laughs> and then like within 10 minutes it's just like a free-for-all everyone killing everyone else Madness. Is there an area that you designate for this, or is this just kind of always a potential thing that could happen? Yeah, it, it could just happen. <laughs> Someone gets <laughs> a rifle and just starts firing. <laughs> oh man, that's great. Yeah. You have a very active Discord as well, and there's tons of fans in there, all very excited for this as well. Uh, how useful has the fan interaction been when working on this? Oh, it's been huge. I mean, we use our Discord as like a sounding board for ideas, and, you know, as as a game developer, we want the community to be as much a part of this. You know, so bringing them into the fold and getting their ideas and feedback is huge, you know, hugely important for us. And it's been great for, for, for every aspect of the build we've been doing. Say, so, so this is what we think. This is what we're planning. And then someone will go, no, but have you thought about this? And we'll go, ah, oh, what a good idea. And it mm. kind of all evolves from there. So, yeah, so... Although there may be half a dozen of us working on it, there's like 3,000 people <laughs> having an input, Sure, so, which is great. It, it, this next question, if you can't address it, I totally understand. Uh, Seth tweeted your video sure, and was like, this is amazing. We love our fans. How did that feel? Well, if I could say, like, what is the best moment of my life? <laughs> now, <laughs> I, I've seen a shuttle launch. I mean, that was pretty cool. And I've got two kids, you know, seeing them born. That was quite cool. But then Seth retweeted that he loves our project and that just drops all of it. <laughs> it's just amazing. It's like, yeah, I can retire now. That's it. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that was just, that blew us away. Absolutely amazing. I imagine even coming after uh, stage nine where you could only work on it for so long and that had to have sucked. And then moving on to something like this where he's like, hey, I love that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the whole situation with Stage Nine, obviously, it was it was something we just decided to do. Mm -hmm. We didn't seek permission. No, it, we thought it was a fair use thing that we were doing, so we kind of went into it quite naively. So when we started to do the Orville, we thought you know, we don't really want to put any time and energy into this until we've spoken to the powers that be. Okay, you know, so so we we you know, we have spoken to Fuzzy Door and Fox, and you know, they haven't given us any kind of like official okay but you know they haven't told us not to do it mm -hmm. and they're aware of what we're doing from day one so you know it, it's literally just a completely unendorsed fan project okay but they already know we exist so you don't feel like you're gambling you with your time really no no it's it's a better position to be in than we were with stage nine mm -hmm. yeah so we're doing it above board this time which is a much better approach uh, talking about your fandom of the Orville a little bit, when did you kind of discover the show and get into it? Oh, that's a good question. I, it was definitely, I would say, midway through season one um, when someone said, oh, check this out. And um, I thought, oh, 
this is pretty good. And, you know, I'd already seen trailers from it beforehand. And of course, mm-hmm. you know, life happened. I got busy and kind of forgot it was coming out. But, um, yeah, I was immediately hooked. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't know if you had the same experience where I did. I kind of entered in around the same point, and I was like, uh, that just looks like a comedy. Like, I don't know if that's going to be exactly what I want to fill that like Star Trek hole in my body, but <laughs> uh, but it proved itself to be that and then some. Oh, absolutely. And I, I love how much the show's matured over the course of two seasons. I mean, it, it was fairly slapstick at the beginning, but it's it's found its feet and it's becoming serious sci-fi as much as it can mm. be in that universe. You know, in the episode you mentioned, you know, with Gordon and, and the um, the character from the past, I mean, that's just fantastic. Yeah, it's, you know, it's great, great sci-fi. Um, yeah, it's everything I, I want from, I guess, the next best thing to Star Trek. Yeah, I imagine that's a, a lifelong thing. Then, if you're talking about making like Star Trek levels back when Quake came out. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're a lifelong sci-fi fan. What is it about sci-fi for you that's, that kind of grabs hold of you so much? I'm not sure. I think it's perhaps escapism, maybe. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hugely into like Lord of the Rings, Firefly, Star Wars, um, Stargate. I was a massive Stargate fan for years. Um, mm-hmm. You know, all those kind of things just speak to me on, on a level. So, uh, yeah. I don't know, really. I think, yeah, I think it's the whole escapism. Being someone who likes to build these type of things, have you uh, always leaned towards the more engineering type characters or different types? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess I'm a huge Scotty fan from the uh, okay. original Enterprise days. I don't actually know who my favorite character is on the Orville. See, it's funny because uh, the Orville, I think all the characters get their fair share of screen time. And I kind of, mm-hmm. I, I love them all equally. I couldn't say that one character stands out as my favorite before above any others. I mean, maybe Bortus because of the comedy aspect, but sure. But yeah, I love them all. Yeah, I'm kind of in that boat too. I, I've stopped to think about it for a moment and be like, which one of these characters is my favorite? And they're all they all have different functions and different purposes on the show. So like on TNG, I'm, I'm a Jordy LaForge fan personally, <laughs> but on the Orville, I'm just like. I don't know. They ju- they feel like they need each other in a way, and I couldn't separate them as much. Yeah, they're, they're like one big family, one mm. like, big bickering family, which is great. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think something I love about the Orville, as opposed to something like Star Trek, is that whereas Star Trek shows you this kind of unrealistic version of the future, mm-hmm. where humans are all kind of perfect, the the Orville is imperfect. You know, the, the humans are human. They're, they're exactly what you would expect people to be like in the future because mm-hmm. live in like what, 400 years from now, they're still human beings. They're still doing human being things, which is kind of cool. Got the, the same jealousy and, and, and stupidity that goes on, which is perfect. Yeah. It's like we've evolved, but not necessarily matured. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot more realistic. So looking at the timeline of the fan experience, I know you're very busy working on it. Is there a projected like first version we're going to be getting into our hands anytime soon? Um, hopefully within a few weeks. Oh, cool. So our, our initial plan is to release a tour of Stage 15, which is the Fox studio where, where it was built, okay. which is the first two decks of the chip. So it won't include things like the shuttle bay um, or engineering or anything. It's literally just the first two decks. Um, okay. Which, which is, it's, it's nice as like a, a small self-contained taster of the kind of thing that they will offer. We wanted to get something out quickly and that seemed like the most sensible way of doing it. And Mm -hmm. then um, once that's done, we'll convert that into literally stage 15. So we'll make it like with plywood on the outside, (laughs) green screens and things. And we'll put that in in the eSIM as something you can load up and actually tour the studio set within the eSIM. Oh, that's great. Um, And then we'll, we'll tear it down and, build the ship proper with things in their proper place that's pretty great yeah so we're hoping i'd say approximately three weeks before we can bring that out we've got a few bugs and things we need to tie up once we're happy with it we'll release it perfect. was there uh, a certain level of hesitation when you put that big video reveal out there like that people would just be knocking your door down like <laughs> wanting to get their hands on this immediately honestly we, we weren't really sure what kind of reaction we would get from it um it was really nerve-wracking going live with that and then and, hmm. and see what everyone was going to think. But um, the, the fan support was largely unanimous. It was great to see people get so excited 
uh, about what we're doing. And you know, we want to do them proud. You know, we want to build something which people are going to love. Well, I can tell you already from what I've seen, I already love it and I haven't even gotten my hands on it yet. Uh, and I'm so excited to give it a try. Uh, if people want to get more information on this project, where can they go? So the best, uh, best place to go is our Discord channel. Um, that's where most of the action is taking place. We, we don't actually have a domain name up and running yet. We, we're kind of in the process of putting that together. We're on to, okay. so busy on the project. We haven't kind of thought about our social media um, presence. But yeah, I mean, we've got a, a Facebook page, a Twitter page, and, and, and most, most commonly Discord. Okay, cool. I'll make sure to link all that stuff in the show notes then so people can just click and get into all that and check it out. Great, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I, uh, like I said, I'm so looking forward to this. The work you're doing, uh, you and your team is absolutely amazing. I know you're spending a lot of time, uh, as a content creator myself, I understand how much it takes just passion and time to create the things you do. And the Orville fans out here are greatly appreciative of it. So thank you just for, just for doing this. Oh, you're welcome. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a work of passion. It's something that we, we all feel in our blood we have to do this so <laughs> yeah but we'll keep going quantum drive is a production of the geek generation if you like this show be sure to check out our other podcasts on the geek generation network at thegeekgeneration.com. if you'd like to support the show and get access to exclusive bonus podcasts along with other perks you can visit our Patreon campaign at thegeekgeneration.com slash support. You can follow Quantum Drive on Twitter at Quantum Drive Pod and me at the Rob Logan. You can follow me on Twitter at Play Katie Play and on Twitch at Katie Peters Plays. And Katie is spelled K-A-T-I-E. Please rate the show and write a review on Apple Podcasts. If you do, we may read your review on an upcoming episode. Finally, questions and comments can be sent to quantumdrive at thegeekgeneration.com. We're out of here for now, but we'll see you soon in, in the, the future. future.